and welcome to today's episode of this Organized Life podcast. I'm your host, Lori Palau, and I'm very excited to have you with us today. We have a really fun topic that is very relevant to a lot of people, and it's a question that I get asked a ton, and it has to do with moving, moving tips, moving strategies, how to prepare for a move, what to do post-move, all of the things. And so I have the perfect guest joining me. So before I bring her out, let me tell you a little bit about her. So joining me is Allie Wensky and Allie and her husband, Dan, have moved like 10 times, I think she said, in 11 years. So she definitely has the moving thing under her belt. Um, she's moved across the country. She has actually used her experience to create a platform where she shares her experiences, knowledge, and expertise, both in a blog and in her book called The Art of Happy Moving. Very fitting. And so she, they also have three kids. And so we're going to talk about what life is like um, as you move, how to prepare for it. Um, what are some things that you should think about? What are some things that you should maybe kind of let go of? Because I think, again, there's so much emotion that comes with moving in terms of, in addition to just the kind of tactical logistical stuff. And so we're going to unpack all of that today. So without further ado, I'm going to bring my guest, Allie Wensky, to the show. Hi, Allie. Hi, Lori. Thank you so much for having me today. I love your podcast. I listen to it all the time. So it's such a pleasure to be a guest today. Thank you so much. Yeah, I'm really glad this is such a hot topic. And if people are listening to this in real time, you know, after COVID, I think so many people really realized, hey, I can one of the good things is I may have flexibility and I can up and work from places. Some people were uprooted and were kind of forced to move in a hurry. But now that kind of the dust is settling and people are reevaluating where they live and how they live and their lifestyle, I think there's a lot of influx. At least that's what I'm seeing kind of in my space. And obviously you could speak into that. Um, and so I think this is a super relevant topic. But before we get into the nuts and bolts, I would love for you to just tell our listeners a little bit about you and your story. For sure, of course. So my, as you mentioned, my husband, Dan and I, we moved 10 times in 11 years. I'm originally from Miami, Florida, but once we got married, we moved from Massachusetts to Maryland, to Ohio, to California, to Illinois, to Tennessee, and back to Illinois with a few local moves in there as well. So we covered a lot of the country and I have three kids that are now 12, 14, and almost 16 years old. And they had made a lot of the moves with us when they were much younger. And, um, but now we're settled in the Chicago suburbs. I'm I am now a real estate agent with Baird and Warner in Winneka, and I had a lot of lives before that where I was working in finance, project management, I went to law school, I started a startup called Friend Matchup, which was to make friends when you move to a new city. And then I started my blog, The Art of Happy Moving. I wrote my book, The Art of Happy Moving. And I was a stay-at-home mom as well for many years. So kind of covered a lot of, a lot of different lives uh, while we moved. And I think that's one of the things I love about moving too, is that you get to reinvent yourself and kind of create this new life. So that's one of the things I talk about a lot in my book of how to take advantage of the fresh start that moving offers. I love that. And seriously, if like anybody that's watching on YouTube, I think my jaw at one point when you were listing all the cities and states was like open. Um, so I'm just curious. So I'm assuming that it was work-related moves. I shouldn't assume that. Maybe it's not. But was it work-related moves that kind of draw, brought you around the country? I'm, I think people are probably wondering what prompted that cross-country zigzag, if you will. Yeah, it was for work and also for education. So I went for a law school, my husband went for medical school and his residency. And then we moved to Tennessee because we thought that's where we wanted to live forever. That was going to be our forever home. And then we realized it wasn't the right space for us. And so we ended up moving back to Illinois. So lots of different reasons. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And so obviously this is kind of your, your happy spot right now, I would think, because as, as you say in your bio, this is where you don't, you don't plan on going anywhere for a while. So yes. I love that <laughs> putting down, putting down roots. So when you were growing up, I'm just curious, kind of going back, I always like to think about kind of the beginning of people's lives to where mm -hmm. they are now. 
What was your life like growing up? Did you move a lot? Or is this something that really kind of happened to you in adulthood? So I grew up in Miami, Florida, and I went to the same school with the same kids from preschool all the way through 12th grade. So small school, same kids the whole time. We moved once, but just within the neighborhood. So not really a lot of moving. And yet every time, every summer I would go to sleepaway camp and I would change my name. So every time I would have, my full name was Alexandra and I would change it. I was Allie, I was Alex, I was Zan, um, just anything that I could do to kind of recreate myself. And so I was, I think I just had that longing to like meet new people, to have fresh starts and everything. So yeah, not a lot of moving growing up. A lot of that happened um, after I graduated from college and then we just zigzagged all over the country. It's interesting that you say that because we live in a small town and my mm -hmm. kids also, went to high, went to like preschool and graduated with the same kids. And yeah. so I, I'm always curious to know, I think you can go one of two ways. You either want to kind of stay in that small town or you want to kind of go and explore and get out. And I love the whole recreation. I think that's, um, I think that's super fascinating. Are you an Enneagram person by any chance? Do you? Yeah. So I was, I know I, you talk about that all the time and I was wondering, I'm like, I don't know exactly what I am. <laughs> okay. Well, we can, we can unpack that. You can, yes. I'm, can you evaluate me? <laughs> yes. So, well, that's, we'll have to do that for another show. We absolutely okay. will. I, I, I don't want to mislead the, the, our listeners. I don't all want to okay. talk about moving. I don't want to talk about the Enneagram, but I'm curious just based on some of your responses, um, if you knew what your Enneagram type was, but we definitely will talk about that for sure. Okay. <laughs> um, so obviously you moved quite a bit and I'm sure there are themes that are kind of congruent throughout all of them. And then there are things obviously that are different. What mm -hmm. are some of the commonalities that you experienced? And again, you were also in different seasons of your life, even though you were an adult, it was, I'm sure that was you and Dan and then you, Dan, and one kid, you, Dan, and two kids, three kids, all the different things. So I'm sure that's also affected the dynamic, but what are some things that were kind of consistent throughout? Yeah, so I talk about this in The Art of Happy Moving in terms of changing your mindset about the move. And I think that's just something that I did naturally where I was always looking ahead of what the next step was instead of looking back on what we were missing out on. And so I kind of equate it to senior spring when you're in high school and you have that senioritis and you can't wait to get to college. And instead of kind of thinking about whatever losses there might be, it's always thinking forward. And so when we moved from the Lincoln Park neighborhood of Chicago to Tennessee, I love I loved living in Chicago. I loved my friends were right across the street from us. I loved all the things we could do in Chicago, but I started focusing on some of the things I wouldn't miss so much, like the rats, <laughs> the really big rats in Lincoln Park. And so I was just thinking like, I'm not going to miss that. I'm not going to miss the garbage trucks that like slam our trash against our walls and things like that, that were not things I would focus on when we lived there. But as we were leaving, I'm like, oh, I'm not going to miss that. So i um, always kind of thinking ahead to the good things about the next area mm -hmm. um, was something that we always did. And so I would say that's one theme is always like changing your mindset to look forward. Um, another thing, as I guess I keep bringing up is taking advantage of that fresh start. And there was a study that was done that found that 36% of successful habit changes were attributed to a move to a new place, which is an amazing number because that's over a third of people who were able to change their habits did it because they moved. And the reason for that is you're breaking up your routines, right? So all of the things that you're used to doing, whatever, you know, if they're bad habits, I mean, a lot of it is location dependent of seeing something or, you know, you go on the balcony every night um, and that was kind of your space to maybe smoke or whatever, you know, whatever your thing is that you're, it's something about the space that you're focused on, but you move to a new place and you can change your habits. And so we did like very small minor changes in our in our own living like when we moved to uh one of our new spaces something that had really bothered me and my husband when our kids were really little is they would have those little sippy cups that were the disposable kind that they would just leave everywhere in the house like they would be like behind a cushion with a little bit of milk in it and whatever we're like oh that's just you know something we want to change and so when we moved we said okay all snacks, drinking, everything will happen at our table, at the kitchen table. And so this one little change has 
completely changed our family dynamic where now anytime someone wants a drink, wants a snack, like they sit at the table and now our kids are teenagers. And yet that's still what we do. So we are always kind of gathered in the kitchen and it's something so minor, but has had this like huge impact on the way we live our lives. So um, you can kind of create your habits when you move to a new place. And in my, in the art of happy moving, I do talk about thinking about that before you move. So you don't just kind of quickly settle into your old habits. Think about what new habits you want to create and then start them from the minute you move to your new space. Um, and so there's one other thing in terms of common themes, and I would say it's relationships and that relationships are everything that investing in your community, investing in your friendships, that's what matters. So um, those would be kind of the big three themes that I have seen throughout our moves and many of the other people that I've interviewed with their moves. I think that's really fascinating because um, I do a lot of studying of habits because mm -hmm. so much of what I do with organization has to do with, you know, the, the themes of what I do, the actual practices, the logistics are pretty consistent, but it's that behavior, which is really what is going to give you that lasting change. And I do, I sometimes, I, it doesn't have to be something monumental like a move, but I feel like for some people where they feel like that's a fresh start, this is my permission. This is my chance to do it over. So yes, I think it's interesting because you could have very easily, I say easily, I'm using that very loosely, but you could have, if you weren't moving saying, you know what the kids you know, eat in their rooms or drink in their rooms and they have sippy cups all over, you know what, we're going to start a new habit in our existing house. But somehow in our minds, we thought it's easier to kind of have that clean slate and start in the new place. And I think a lot of people feel that way and can approach it. But I also just want to caution people that you don't have to uproot yourself to do those things. Right. But it is a great <laughs> opportunity if you are going to be facing a move if you are going to be facing some sort of big change and it could even just be like a renovation like hey we're renovating this room or we're doing something we're getting new carpeting or whatever it is you know now we're going to start changing our habits we're going to start changing our behavior and you can apply that and like look at your space through a new lens and I love that about using this as a as a reset if you will yeah. And like you said, you don't have to move. Still two thirds of people did it without moving. Right. So um, just and just one little change and just one small change in your behavior can make a huge difference. So um, it can be done for sure. Yeah. And I really do want to emphasize the whole building relationships because so much of how we thrive as people has to do with relationships and community. I'm a big proponent of community. I run a community for professional organizers in my personal life. I'm very involved in my community. So I really think personal connection is so, so important. And even for people like I'm an extrovert and so I'm always out there, but even for people who are introverts, I think just knowing that you have that that connection point to somebody, even if you aren't actively engaging in it, is so critical. And I think for a lot of people, because I have friends who have moved and I have friends who have moved like cross country and had to restart everything from friends to doctors through, you know, all of the things of just finding out like what the new neighborhood is. And it's harder as we get older in adulthood. Can you speak into that? Because you've done this as an adult and yeah. for people that are doing that, that maybe don't have, you know, kids around to kind of use as the like, oh, I'll meet you at the park kind of thing. How do you build that community? How do you build those relationships? Yeah, well, that's the whole reason that I started The Art of Happy Moving was this exact point that it's hard to meet people when you move somewhere new. And so the first thing I recommend is to be proactive and to try to find people before you move. So when you do that, go out on Facebook or Instagram and just reach out to people and say, hey, I'm moving to Seattle. Do you know anyone who lives there? And making that, that connection before you move is so helpful because you can get recommendations on all the things you talked about, doctors and hairstyle. Hairstylist is actually the one that everyone misses the most. <laughs> so yes. that's the one thing. Oh my gosh. Like, I need my hairstylist. Yes, and, for yeah. sure. <laughs> 
-hmm. And a lot of people that, you know, fly back to wherever they used to live for quite some time to see their old hairstylists before they're ready to make the jump. Um, but just having that connection with one person makes a huge difference before you move there. And then once you move there, asking them like, you know, can you connect me with someone else? And growing from, you know, one friend to two friends is much easier than making that jump from zero to one, which is why I recommend just, you know, trying to do that early. Uh, another thing that I recommend is being confident. And I know that that is so hard when you are going into new space. So even if you are just creating, you know, faking it, <laughs> faking yeah. that confidence when you get there. So one of the situations I had is we moved from Chicago to Knoxville, Tennessee, and I am very much an extrovert. I moved all over. I was willing to throw myself into any sort of situation. And I found that it was really hard to break into an area where people had had relationships their whole life. It was a very close knit community and it was tough to make new friends. And so one of the mistakes that I made was I was really desperate to make new friends by the time, you know, this time had passed. And so I, um, I recommend getting involved with situations where you're just enjoying yourself, like go out and find a hobby that you really love where you're just having fun. It's not with the purpose of making new friends. You're just there because you love it. So one of the things that I tried when we moved to Chicago is I just got involved in knitting. I never knitted before. And I'm like, I'm just going to try this. I'll get involved in this knitting group. And even if you're an introvert, you can sit there in this group of people around you and just kind of be listening. You don't have to be super involved with meeting other people, um, but you still feel a part of a group. You're part of a community. And over time, you can get involved in it and start talking and be, you know, just kind of reach out to people. But it's a good way to get involved, whether I've also taken guitar classes, group guitar lessons. And the important thing is just getting out of your house, getting out of your house, meeting people, doing something you love, and you will attract your tribe that way because you are in your zone and you're with other people who are also doing something that they love. So, um, you know, be proactive, get involved and um, be patient. Realize that it takes time. You're not going to make a best friend in a week. Your kids are not going to make a best friend in a week. So I feel like we put so much pressure on ourselves and our children to make friends when they started a new school, but just realize it takes time. It doesn't happen right away. And I think one of the hard things too, is you've left from your peak of friendships from wherever you left all of that time and effort that you put into making those friendships it, it took time. And then you start, you know, you go from the top of, of that peak to zero. And so if people are not ready for kind of that jump in relationships, it can shock you. And so just be aware that's what, what's going to happen and that it's going to take time to build and that it's going to be great and it's going to be fine. It's just putting in the effort to, um, to build those relationships again. Yeah, I think it's great. And it's, it's interesting as you're, as you're talking. So I have a daughter that just went off to college this past year, and obviously it's a different situation in, but it's still starting over new. And I know she's struggling to find her people. And again, like you grew up in a small town where everybody knew everybody. And so it's an adjustment. And, and I keep saying the same thing, like, just keep putting yourself out there join clubs, join organizations, try to just be out there and, you know, go first. And for some people like extroverts, like you and myself, it's okay. And we're probably, some people are better at faking it till they make it. But I know for some people that it's a little bit more challenging because they're shy or more introverted, more insecure, whatever that they're, it, you know, I think it's important to keep re repeating this, you know, and to hopefully it will sink in because I'm thinking this is great advice and recommendations, whether you're an adult or again, people that are going off to school or for kids that parents that are moving when kids have to transition, you know, kids transitioning into school and trying to again, start over and think about like, who am I going to sit with at the lunch table? Like these are all, all these intangibles. And I know, I want to talk a little bit about how that emotional weight kind of plays into the physical productivity, for lack of a better word, part of the unpacking and making things happen, both on the front end of like, how do we prepare for a move in terms of the logistics? And then once we're there, how do we unpack our space? What does that look like? Um, you know, because again, 
I have people, and I'm sure that you've talked to people that are like, I've moved six times and I keep moving the same boxes over and over again. And we want to avoid that as somebody yeah. who, you know, talks, uh, you know, about organizing and decluttering. That's something that we want to avoid. So we want to use these opportunities to kind of help minimize that. So can you just talk a little bit about that before we go into our first break? About unpacking or? Well, you know what? I mean, really just about, you know, how do you feel that, um, I guess I didn't really ask a question. I kind of just said a bunch of things. So do you have sort of a framework that you use to help people stay on task um, in terms of, okay, we know we're going to move. This is kind of the plan of action or the method that we should kind of work through. Yeah, so I have both in my book and on my blog, I have a moving checklist that you can download for free online and it has kind of eight weeks out, you can, here's what you should do before the move. And I, I think that that definitely helps take away some of the stress of being able to know, okay, I'm not gonna miss this little detail. Cause as you know, Lori, there's so many details that come with moving and decluttering and all of that. So um, it's just a checklist, check one thing off a day and just kind of make your, make your way through that. So I think that helps take away some of the stress before the move. Uh, but I also think it's important to have um, to think about your emotional side of it, that it's not just the logistics. So I also have in, in my book, I talk about having like a bucket list of things you want to do in your city before you leave. So make that, um, make that checklist for yourself of, I really want to visit this restaurant or um, go to this concert. I know things are different right now because of COVID. So, um, you know, whatever there is that you miss that you want to go through and think about the people too. Like I match the people with the location. So you get all of that. You get to say, goodbye to friends and you get to say goodbye to the locations that matter to you. Um, so that's all before the move. And then in terms of after the move with the unpacking and everything, I do have different things that I recommend. But if you're moving to a new city, I highly prioritize getting out there and meeting people and seeing the city, discovering restaurants and places to go and all of that, even before all the, the unpacking will get done. There's no doubt that you will get to the unpacking, but I don't think it's as critical to spend your you know, first two weeks in a city making sure your home is perfect, where I think it's more important to get out there and starting to meet people and not being so comfortable with being at home all the time. You kind of push yourself out there because you know that's what you need to do um, before you get every last box unpacked. That is a very interesting approach. We're going to come back and talk about that because I have a totally different philosophy. Now, obviously, <laughs> you're the moving expert, but um, we're going to take a quick break and we're going to come back because I have a, I have a counter argument to that. So okay. sit tight. <laughs> if you're a professional organizer or have thought about becoming a professional organizer but not sure where to start, you might want to check out our SBO Partner Program. It's a community of professional organizers from all over the globe who are running their own independent companies, but looking for community and some business strategies on how to grow and scale their business. To learn more, visit simplybeorganized.com and click on the work with me tab. All right, Allie. So before break, you made a very interesting point, which I love because I think having different perspectives is so important. And again, I think this goes back to so much about how we see the world through different lenses and personality types. And you really are putting an emphasis on getting out there and meeting people. And as somebody who believes or really practices getting my home in a place that that is the foundational piece for everything else as the building block. My approach would be come in, unpack everything, get yourself situated first, and then go out there. I don't think there's a right or wrong. I think it's a, just a different way of looking at things. Um, knowing that you have that, you know, get yourself situated, go out there, and then it'll, the, the unpacking will come. Do you have some sort of guidelines that you map out either in the book or the blog of, we want to be unpacked by a certain amount of time. If you haven't unpacked this in a certain amount of time, it should get donated. Do you have any of those kind of roadmaps for us? Well, I have a roadmap in terms of 
what to start unpacking first. I don't really give a timeline because I think everyone is in a different situation when you're moving. I mean, some people move on Friday and start a new job on Monday and they're getting the kids started at a new school. There are you know, a million things that are happening at once. So I think putting that time pressure on yourself, like I must have this house unpacked by X is, is a lot of stress. And so I... I do recommend unpacking the children's rooms first, or at least kind of the basic things in terms of the bedding and getting the kids situated so that then you can get yourself situated as well. And the kids can kind of have their own space where they can have like an oasis and a relaxing place to be while everything else is going on. Uh, one thing I also recommend is when you are packing, label everything in as much detail as possible because you think you know what's in that box but when you are moving an entire household and you just put kitchen it's it's just not enough like you need to know what's inside the box and then i recommend putting a heart on any box that has your favorite items in it and so if you're packing I love up that your, yeah i love that <laughs> I'm like, if you. anybody's watching and sees me put my head on i'm taking notes so i'm literally <laughs> taking notes on what you're saying so go ahead <laughs> So I recommend putting a heart on any of your favorite items that are in a box. And so if I was packing up my space and I was packing up my bathroom, for example, I have my bathrobe, I would put a heart on the box with my bathrobe because as soon as I move to my new place, I wanna be able to unpack that, my bathrobe. Um, it could be pictures, books, like your favorite recipe book, whatever it is, if that's in the box, put a heart on it. And so then when you're unpacking, I recommend unpacking your heart boxes first because those are the items you love. Those are what feels like home. So you can go around, unpack your heart boxes, and then go out, meet some people and then everything else you'll get to, you will, you will go out and you'll unpack your dishes and all, you know, I do recommend unpacking the kitchen after, you know, your kids' bedrooms and then the kitchen, cause that's the heart of the home. So you get to the kitchen, you unpack all of that. Um, but some of the other things, like you probably had a junk drawer and all of that was in a box. And that's really, it's a lot of work to get through that box. And so you will get to it, but, um, you know, kind of get your main spaces settled. I do think having a settled home is, is very important in terms of feeling good about yourself, your space, um, but take a break, cut yourself off and say, okay, if I'm going to do as much as I can until 6 PM, and then we're going out for dinner or we're getting takeout or we're, you know, going to this park, kind of just setting a time frame for yourself where, okay, I've done as much as I can with my home. Now, now we're going to go out and have some fun. So, um, it's a balance of trying to get through both. Absolutely. No, I, I agree a hundred percent. And, um, shoot, you said something that I wanted to, I wanted to comment on, but of course I, I, I was like, yes, but I totally, it'll come, it'll come back to me. It'll, it'll absolutely. Oh, it was about the junk drawer. Okay. People we're not going to pack the junk drawer. We're going to not, we're going to go through beforehand. What yes. are you speaking of which? So do you speak to that? Cause I think for some people, and it's, I think it also depends on the context of your move. You know, are you moving? How quickly do you have to move? Is it something like, again, I know during COVID, a lot of people like evacuated quickly. So yeah, you're just taking what you're go, you know, what you need and you're going. But a lot of times if people are doing this and they can be very systematic about it, do you talk about kind of really paring down before you move? Because obviously that's stuff that we talk about. I'm just wondering if you have any thoughts on that. Yes, I am a huge believer in decluttering everything like just get rid of everything it's the move is so much easier if you just like just move with nothing so i am a big proponent proponent of decluttering before your move however i am also realistic <laughs> and um i know that it's a lot of stuff happens before a move and i so i don't want to put too much pressure on people to feel like they need to declutter everything as much as it really will make your life so much easier and better if you can declutter before your move. But a lot of times people don't realize a how much they have. I think that's the biggest issue that people have when they move is they don't realize how much they have and how much time it will take to go through everything. And so give yourself at least 50% more time, 100% more time to go through your items as you're decluttering uh, and get rid of as much as you possibly can. But what happens with a lot of people is like, they don't have that much time to move. They get told you're relocating. It's time to, you know, someone gets sick in a family, a family member, you have to move. Like there's so many life circumstances that happen. And then people do the brush of like, okay, I'm just throwing this all in a box, which for me, I'm like, ah, declutter first. But yeah. you know, the life happens. And sure. so if you can't get to it beforehand, get to it afterwards. 
Um, but I, yes, I have a whole chapter about decluttering. I give lots of talks about decluttering and also decluttering as if you were moving. So even for all the people who are listening who are not moving, I still highly recommend going through my decluttering order for moving because it's a much bigger when you declutter for a move, it's a lot different than just spring cleaning. I mean, you are getting rid of furniture, which is one of the biggest items I think people overlook when they're decluttering their spaces. Uh, so I recommend kind of taking pictures of your home, looking around. If you were staging your home for to sell, would you keep that huge armoire or this gigantic oversized couch or you know whatever you have in your space, would you move that with you? And if the answer is no, you don't love it, you're not moving it with you, why are you keeping it now? So get rid of it, get rid of items like as you're going through spring cleaning, like think of it from a much bigger picture of decluttering as if you were moving and would you still keep all these items? I think that's a great point. And again, we, we oftentimes become what I call clutter blind to what's in front of us yes. because you just, you just are, you're so used to looking at it, it just becomes a fixture, you know? And it doesn't have to be the pile of paper. Like you said, it could be the oversized, armoire that you're not really using, but it's just kind of there and it's not hurting anybody, so to speak. So we just kind of hold on to it. But really there are ways that we can kind of jumpstart and bring new life into our spaces, even if we're not physically moving, that we can again, in, you know, use those same kind of that same mindset. Because I've talked to people that have said to me that are just overwhelmed with clutter and said, I just wish I I could just like move and start over and you sort of can to a degree you you can you can play that game in your mind even if you aren't moving okay well what if I were if I were moving what would I be taking with me if I were moving what would I be getting rid of and be okay with getting rid of and I love using that as a tool to kind of help you rethink about you know decluttering your space so that's awesome yeah. I did have another question what about, or do you talk about people that go into like a transitional move? So maybe you're moving to a temporary housing before you move to your permanent house. Um, I know I've worked with people helping them because that kind of adds a different layer, a different dynamic, an extra step of what's going with me to the temporary space versus going into maybe a storage unit or whatever. Mm -hmm. What are you, what are your thoughts on that? Well, I always recommend the decluttering. So doing the big decluttering, obviously, before the move. I actually see the temporary move very similarly to a regular move, where we did the same thing. We moved temporarily into a home for six months. And so we did pack some things that were for storage only. And it was really nice living with less when we had these items in storage that we were going to use for a new place. But we realized you, could, you don't actually need a lot of these things. And so after we made the temporary move, we kind of looked through those things, made sure, okay, do we really need these in our new home? We live without them for six months. Um, so it kind of, re you think about it again, but when you are moving temporarily, I think it's important to feel as if you are going to be there in terms of making it your home and not just, um, you know, having a mattress on the floor and nothing else out because it is your space. Six months is a long time. I mean, it may not feel like it, but this is six months is a long time. And so we made sure that, that we bought a new rug for the kid's bedroom just to make it feel warmer and softer. And, and we put pictures up, like we didn't just think, okay, this is only for six months. It doesn't matter because it's, it's your home. So I think even if it's temporary, you should try to make it as much as home as possible. Again, with the heart boxes, you have that all of your favorite things will still be around you. And then the other things, if either you have a garage, you can put it or a temporary storage that you can put other items that you absolutely need or feel like you'll need for your new home. And then just evaluate those. Once you do move again, do I really need these things? I love it. I think it's great. And um, so one other thing before we go into, well, well, is there anything else? Cause I have to ask you, one of the things that you mentioned in your, um, in your bio was about your toy story your toy, not story, toy store method. And I want to ask you about that. Um, it's a, it's your method for decluttering, but is there anything else on the topic of moving that you want to share with our listeners? Well, in terms of moving, I think the biggest thing is changing your mindset, 
uh, and thinking about the habits that you want to change, the things that, you know, it's so important to take advantage of the fresh start. So, um, and be patient with yourself, have fun with it. It really is. I know people are like happy moving. That's such an oxymoron, but it's true. It can be happy I, looking at the positives of it and to feel like you do have control over the situation, even if um, life feels like you may not have control with everything that's going on, but to focus on the control that you do have, decluttering, organizing, having a checklist, and just making it a less stressful process uh, for the it. moving part. I love it. And asking for help. Like yes. asking for help also, <laughs> I think, you know, and again, I know you said that you are also a realtor. Like I would be like ask if I was moving to a new city or I would be, and hopefully I'd be working with a realtor that I trust and that I, I would be like, where do you get your hair done? Or maybe if they didn't like, you know, where do I go? Where's the best place for coffee? Where do you go? Where's the, you know, Pilates studio, whatever it is, you know, just again, asking these people so that you can have, um, you could start to not feel as much of an outsider. Cause I think that Absolutely. makes it hard. Absolutely. And invest it. in good packing tape. That's my other moving tip. Oh, there you go. Okay. <laughs> That's good to know. Um, all right. So let's just quick switch gears because I was very curious to ask you about this toy store method of decluttering with your kids. So explain how you came up with it, what that looks like and um, share it with our listeners. Sure. So my, you know, my kids moved with us a lot. They were used to decluttering, but then we settled into our house here in the Chicago suburbs. And I, I think it's really important to keep the decluttering going. It's not just because we're moving. It's a way of life. And I wanted to teach the kids about it, but I wanted to make it fun. So I created a toy store in our basement. And what I did is I collected every single toy that we had in our entire house. And then I set it up with like a toy store where I would have the Barbies in one place and the matchbox cars and everything kind of in their own little section. And so then I handed the kids a shopping bag and a, a pad of sticky notes. And I, they are standing on the basement stairs. And I'm like, do, 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 welcome to the one ski toy store. And I'd lift up my arms and the kids would go running in. And so the way it works is they can buy any toy that they want. They go shopping and they can either buy it by putting it in the bag or putting a sticky note, uh, the little sticky tabs on them if they're bigger items. So they run around and they start buying everything. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I just did all this work. I'm bringing all these toys and they're just going to buy everything. And so in the beginning they do, they're buying everything like, oh, I want to keep this. But amazingly, they start to slow down. And there will be, at the end of this, there are dozens and dozens of toys that they have not picked, that they do not want. And so what I do then is I put aside the toys they have picked and I let them come around again to go shopping for, you know, a second time, um, just to make sure there's nothing that they've missed. And, you know, they might find like a few things, but overall they kind of, they've gone through everything and they've kept all the things that they want to keep. And then the rest of them, we usually donate and or give them to you know, family or friends. And so what is amazing about the way that decluttering has changed in our house is we're not saying keep or donate or asking them to choose what they wanna get rid of. Now they are deciding what they wanna keep. And it's really changed the mindset in our house because they love it. Like we do it with books. We switch off every year between toys and books and I'll create a bookstore and put all of their books out. And uh, one recent year when we did it, we had 164 books that we donated to Bernie's Book Bank. And I didn't even know we had 164 books to donate, you know, to add like at all, but even like that many to donate. And it's just the things when they're kind of packed in all different areas of your home, you don't realize how much you have. Um, and then when you see everything laid out, it's, it, it's, the kids can see how much they have. And that even if they're donating like some of these things, they still have so many other things left over and they really just want to keep the things that they love. So they love it. They do it. We do it every year and it's super fun. The kids are like, when's donation weekend? And so I was going to um, say, so do you do great. it? Is this like an annual thing that you do? It is. I love it. I think that's, I think it's great. And it's interesting because I was wondering when you were originally talking about it, like, do you give them a certain amount of sticky notes? So they have to make choices, but basically it seems like they have free reign to, and yes. even knowing that they have free reign, they still leave some by the wayside. So yeah. I think that's, I think that's really, I think that's great. I love that approach. I always love getting the kids involved. That's a big mm -hmm. thing for me. Um, I think in the earlier that you could start, the better it is. So I absolutely love this method. It's awesome. Thank you. <laughs> and All right. People ask me, oh, sorry, people often ask me like at what age? And my kids started doing this when they were toddlers. And so I think 
you know, in the beginning when they're very young, they may end up picking everything but two items. It's possible. And I think like, even if that is the case, you should celebrate what they have done. And because it is a habit, it's not like decluttering will come naturally to, to everyone and at different ages. So for some of my kids, it was harder for them to let go of items when they were younger. But now that we've done this year after year after year, they're used to it. And they realize like, it's okay to let things go. And they also recognize all the people we have helped. Like we, we have a whole board that we set goals before we start. Why are we decluttering? It's so we create more space and so we can find the things we love. And we put the organizations that we're going to donate to. And so they have have that in mind and they know who it's going to. So uh, it is a way of life and it is a way of teaching your kids so that once they go off to college and they're out on their own, that they can do this um, for themselves. I love it. Life skills. And that's all that we teach here. So love it, love yeah. it, love it. <laughs> all right. Before we go to our last break and put you back in the hot seat, just let our listeners know the best place to find you where they can get the book, download the free checklist, all that stuff. And of course, we'll have everything in our show notes, but just, you know, Give them a shout out right now. Thank you. So The Art of Happy Moving is available wherever books are sold. So you can find it at your local independent bookstore. It's also on Amazon. And um, so anywhere you buy your books, my blog is artofhappymoving.com. And so you can just go on there, get free moving checklists. There are a lot of things on my resources page. They're all like a one-stop shop to making your move easy. And then you can find me on Instagram, Facebook, Pinterest. I'm at Ali Wenske. So A-L-I-W-E-N-Z-K-E. Uh, and I love connecting with readers and I give a lot of talks about decluttering and organizing. So follow me and um, I'll tell you whenever I have an upcoming talk awesome. happening. Great. And again, we'll have links to all of that in our show notes. So be sure to check that out. Okay. We're going to take one last break. We're going to come back and just wrap up with our wrap up questions. So sit tight. All right, Allie, this has been such a fun and informative conversation. I love it. It's like got my wheels turning of things that I want to do in my own house, for sure. Um, aside from your own book, which obviously is very inspirational for a lot of people, I always like to ask our guests, what book has inspired you in your life? It could be personally, it could be professionally that you can share with our listeners. I, I love reading. I have lots of books that are, this is a hard question because I have okay. many favorite books. I, uh, I did love the life-changing magic of tidying up Marie Kondo. That was a great book. Um, but I have a couple authors that are fictional authors that I really like that are Kristen Hanna and Frederick Back Bachman. Okay. And the reason I think that I love them so much is their themes are really about community and how we are all tied to one another and how our actions impact the actions of the people around us. So um, I think it's, it is so important. I have, I think the number one thing I've learned from all my moves are that relationships are everything. And mm. so I, I love those, those books and, and how we do impact each other and just get, you know, building a, a relationship with the, the coffee shop owner or, um, you know, anyone in your apartment complex. I mean, those little interactions every day are what make life, you know, happy. So, um, so yeah, those are a couple authors that I really love. I agree. I agree. Thank you so much for saying that. And then of course, we always ask our guests two questions. Where in this particular season of your life, do you feel the most organized and where do you feel like a bit of a hot mess? So I'm kind of going to answer the same thing for both. <laughs> so That's fine. I feel really, or so in life in general, I would say like in terms of of organization, I, I try to be very organized in goal setting, um, kind of my to-do list, my schedule, like I'm very big on time blocking and having, that's what makes me feel organized is, is having my schedule organized. Now where I feel like a hot mess is my kids' schedules just changed on Monday. So I have three kids in three different schools and they are all involved in many different activities. So I have all my like carpool spreadsheets set up and where everyone needs to be. And so two of my older kids, their fall sports just ended on Saturday. And so this week they're starting all new activities. So my, my schedules all are, are all over the place, but so I'm feeling a bit like a, a hot mess in that area until it gets organized again and they figure out what new activities they're doing and I can figure out carpool. So um, kind of both. <laughs> feeling like a it. hot mess in that no, area at the moment. I love it because it just goes to, again, it goes to show it, that it's a fluid. It's, it's an ongoing process. And even when you feel like you've like mastered something and you have life, something pivots and you have to 
readjust and adapt. And I, I think that goes for all of us. And I, I love it, but uh, you'll get there. Like we all do. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> no, you will. And it's, and you have an almost 60 year old. So soon one will be driving and then we'll, you'll have one less. You'll have a whole other set of headaches. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, Allie, thank you so much again for coming on our show and sharing your story and great, great actionable advice and suggestions. Um, love, you know, showcasing people who have kind of walked the walk and not just, you know, talk the talk. Um, if this is your first time tuning in, welcome to our show. Please make sure you hit the subscribe or the follow button so that you don't ever miss any episodes. Um, again, follow us on social media. We're also on YouTube at Simply Be Organized. So thank you for being a part of our community. We love hearing from you. And we hope you stick around. So until next week, I am Lori Palau. Peace out.